So thank you very much. And uh, thank you also to the local organizing, organizing committee for inviting me and giving me the opportunity uh, to, uh, to report over, uh, about our recent results, which are more or less understood or not understood still uh, under investigation. And um, <clears throat> so also thanks to my main contributors to the talk. Uh, let's say me some, allow me some words about uh, the experiment Wendelstein 7X. The stellarator Wendelstein 7X is a modular and optimized stellarator. I come to this a little bit later. And uh, the magnetic field in case of the stellarator is uh, exclusively generated by external superconducting coils. That means <clears throat> that the plasma is three-dimensional and so this means that we also have three-dimensional superconducting coils. Um, <clears throat> the steady state magnetic field on the axis is two and a half Tesla and uh, the layout of the uh, experiment is uh, for quasi steady state uh, operation for half an hour with 10 megawatt heating power. Here you see uh, as an example a picture during the assembly phase uh, of uh, Wendelstein and you see nicely here the vacuum vessel, the plasma vessel. Um, as you know, uh, the plasma is three-dimensional. That means the cross-section uh, changes 10 times around the machine from a tri triangular plane to a beam-like uh, shape plane. And here's something in between. Yeah, you see it on this side. And then surrounding, uh, or um, yeah, the plasma vessel is surrounded then by this three-dimensional superconducting coils and planar coils here. And the whole uh, thing is then contained by a cryostat. And between cryostat and the plasma vessel, there is a vacuum in order to insulate the cryogenic temperatures at the coils to the room temperature and to the hot temperatures of the plasma. So here, it's a more a principle what you see. Um, you see here are the plasma. And if you look from the top to the plasma, it's not really a circle. Yeah? It's a five-fold geometry. And um, <clears throat> so what I told you, I think the cross-section is uh, changing 10 times around the machine. And due to this um, uh, five-fold geometry, the uh, magnetic field uh, at the outside of the plasma is distorted and forms islands. So you see here, um, the confining magnetic field and at the outside you see five islands which are naturally there, which develop by this perturbation and which we use uh, to um, control the particle which leaves the plasma. So if particles leave the plasma here, they come into this region between the island uh, uh, to the last closed flux surface, let's say, and then they are transported uh, by the islands uh, to a place where we cut these islands here by so-called diverter plates. So we make a diverter on this way and um, so we call this here natural island diverter. Behind the diverter we have a pumping system. So this is the way uh, how we control our particles And the mission of the experiment is now the study of long pulse capability for stable high performance operation. So this means we have to look for uh, plasma scenarios with, uh, a long pul uh, with high performance conditions. And this means we have to achieve simultaneously um, high densities, that means in the order of 10 to the 20 per cubic meter and high iron temperature, not separately, simultaneously. Uh, and high temperature means uh, something around iron temperature around 4 kV. And this means that we, for the high density, we have to have a working diverter, density control, and also concerning radiation losses by impurities, we should have no degradation by these radiation losses. 
and uh, therefore we have to reduce the impurity sources and we have to study the uh, transport properties of impurities inside the core plasma. The heating system, it's our working horse is the electron cyclotron heating, ECRH, but usually at this high density ECRH is in cutoff, so it's not possible at high density to heat the plasma. So uh, we have to also to explore O2 heating, the second harmonic. Uh, there has a higher cutoff density and works, and also some first experience with our neutral beam injection. And of course, the third point is we have to uh, cope with impurities in the right way so that we use it to have edge radiation cooling in order to, uh, um, to reduce the power load onto the diverter plates. Now let's come first to the plasma heating uh, methods. As I told you, the working horse in our case is ECRH. Um, <clears throat> we have uh, the frequency uh, of the electron cyclotron uh, heating system to 140 gigahertz. And here you see one of these gyrotrons. Um, we have 10 of them, and each of them has uh, nearly one megawatt, let's say, heating power, a little bit less. And uh, <clears throat> the heating power is transferred by uh, quasi-optically by a mirror system into the machine. And as I told you, um, the X mode has a cutoff energy at 1.2, 10 to the 20. So at high density, we cannot use it. We use it for low density plasmas. But um, for, um, for higher densities, we have to switch to O mode. This is also a new field for us, um, which seems to work quite well. Uh, o mode heating. <coughs> has a problem that the um, heating efficiency is not so high. It's only 70% for the single pass uh, through the plasma. And this means uh, we have to send the beam several times through the plasma by mirrors here. So we have multi-pass uh, multi absorption. Um, <clears throat> and the second thing is the efficiency for O2 heating um, starts only if the base temperature of the plasma has still a certain value. That means something around, let's say, 2 kV. Above 2 kV, you can use this heating system quite well. And it also seems to work successfully. Other heating methods for high density, like OXB, um, conversion, uh, mode conversion uh, heating is still under in development and um, has not been studied up to now at W7X. And here you see, for an example, uh, you see a discharge with 30 seconds uh, and quite stable. Yes, you see the density is something or very close to 10 to the 20 already. Yes, 5 megawatt ECRH and also the Z effective, which is a measure for the impurity content in the plasma, is still uh, constant. And you see that after the ignition phase at the beginning here, uh, the, um, the plasma detaches from the, um, from the diverter plates, and you see that the power load on the diverter plates, this is a diverter and the infrared camera, it's strongly reduced. You cannot see it here. It's something around 1.5 megawatt. And it's, in principle, this is exactly what we want to have, in principle. This is a discharge with a little bit higher uh, density. We go now up to 1.6, 10 to the 20. And this here, at the beginning, is the density feedback system, which mm, works roughly to this time, let's say. Please excuse. But nevertheless, at the end, we reached uh, also very constant uh, plasma conditions. At these high densities, we have uh, comparable electron and ion temperatures, and also the load to the um, diverter is uh, clearly reduced. So this works. Uh, the neutral beam injection um, was commissioned during this time. So we, uh, I think the results are still under development in the moment. Um, 
I think we had only two PMEs out of eight in operation. That means we have only one, uh, three and a half megawatt uh, neutron beam injection power. And we use it for ion and electron heating, of course, and plasma fueling and fast ion investigation. It's only this box which was working. <clears throat> Here you see, nevertheless, uh, some profiles, or re some results. You see here, this is ECRH with Ignite the Plasma, and then it's uh, uh, overtaken by neutral beam injection, pure neutral beam injection, and uh, I think it's, we succeeded to keep the plasma. The density is still rising to this time, and what we saw is that we immediately, with neutral beam injection, we have extremely high uh, um, peaked density profiles, yes. And nevertheless, if we would add ECRH power additional to the neutral beam injection, then the profiles would, um, would become flat or flatter. So this is still under investigation, but nevertheless, we reach densities up to 2 times 10 to the 20, and it's very close to what we want to have. Here, of course, at these high temperatures, you have comparable electron and ion temperature because of the good coupling between both species. And um, the temperature here, ion temperatures here, something around uh, 1.7 kV, but this depends on the low heating power. We had only 3.5 megawatt heating power. But <coughs> we observe that we have some kind of clipping of the iron temperature. So if we want to increase the iron te temperature, uh, somehow uh, we saw that we reached something around 1.9 kV iron temperature. This is the electron temperature, this is the iron temperature. And somehow we could not increase it. Even if you increase the heating power, uh, it is not possible. Here we increase the heating power and you say it stays here. So just to increase the, uh, the heating power does not lead to higher uh, uh, iron temperatures. So there is deeper physics involved which we uh, start to investigate now in detail. Nevertheless, the question is why? And you see that some plasma conditions oh, exceed this, uh, this limit, and we could reach uh, higher um, iron temperatures. Uh, now, what is the recipe to get higher iron temperatures? Uh, you can see it very nicely at this discharges here. Uh, you see the, the discharge start with ECRH uh, power at uh, 2.7 megawatt, and what you see is that the electron temperature, that the density is very low, this case, and we have very high electron temperatures and very low ion temperatures. And because of this large difference, the coupling between uh, these two species um, is not very good. And that means we cannot transfer uh, energy from the electrons to the ions. And so we strongly increase using pellets, a sequence of pellets, the density. And, of course, with rising density, we improve the coupling between the two species, but simultaneously also, we decrease the electron temperature down to the value of the ion temperature. And then, again, additionally, the, um, uh, the coupling between electrons and ions works, and then we have to slowly increase the electron temperature and try to, to pull the iron temperature to higher values. This is one recipe we found uh, during this uh, our uh, during this campaign. Um, in this discharge, we reached densities up to 10 to the 20 per cubic meter, and we reached iron temperatures of 3.8 kV transiently. Of uh, unfortunately, in the moment. But nevertheless, these values here are nearly the projected values for the originally pro uh, projected values for uh, Wendelstein 7x. And of course, we reached a quite high 
triple product, um, but only transiently and it's only as an additional information. Um, let's come back to the iron temperature clipping. Um, if you take a look to these discharges here, where you exceed the limit, you find that all of these discharges here uh, have some kind of density peaking, peak density profiles. So this is the case in some low power ECRH cases, high performance pellet shots, of course with pellet injection, neutral beam injection, and also if you insert boron powder, yes, which we did the first time during the last uh, um, days of the campaign. This also leads to um, peak profiles and also if we use TESPL, I think Monica yesterday report about the TESPL injector also, that means impurity pellets. And then we reach it. So there is some connection between the density gradient and the iron temperature. And if you take a look to this discharge here, you see that here is again a density ramp with pellets. And before this density ramp, uh, when we have, this is here the iron temperature, this flat line. We have a iron temperature of above, let's say 1.8 kV. And if you look to the uh, profiles of the density and the iron temperature, then you see that the density is flat and somewhere at the edge there is a gradient and the gradients for the iron temperature are here in, yeah, let's say, outer half of the plasma. So they are se separated somehow. And then uh, we uh, uh, increase the density by pellets and uh, during this phase also we have a strong density fluctuation signal, what we observe. And if we reach the maximum density, then the density fluctuation immediately drops. And what you see is that the diamagnetic energy rises and also the iron temperature here rises. So, uh, and if you look to the profiles, you see that the density profile now is shifted inward and is close to the uh, gradient region where the iron temperature has its gradient. So, our hypothesis, let's say, really hypothesis to this time, is maybe a turbulence or, uh, has, is in, involved in these things. We are investigating this in detail now. And uh, that is maybe also a ro um, plays a role for the uh, temperature clipping. So let's come now to the core um, uh, transport of impurities, which is of course very important, especially for stellarators, uh, which where, uh, let's say, a long confinement of impurities is predicted in principle. So let me allow to show you here a cross-section of the plasma. This is the center. This is a plasma vessel. And first of all, the impurities are produced by a plasma surface interaction, of course, at the vessel wall and come into the plasma. So what we have to do is we have to control these sources. That's very important. And we can do this uh, very effectively uh, by, um, by boronization. We make a boron layer all over the, uh, the wall and can reduce... Um, um, a lot of impurity um, species, fluxes of impurity species in the, into the plasma. The uh, impurity species which survive this comes into the scrape-off layer, and the scrape-off layer is the layer where all our islands are placed. And these islands have the possibility, if you increase, uh, if you increase the edge density in the islands, then uh, the islands are able to screen impurities. So this is a kind of second barrier for the impurities. And uh, those impurities which survive this and come into the core plasma, yeah, I think 
they make the normal transport in the plasma. So that means here you have the flux of impurities, which is uh, determined by a diffusive part. You see the gradient of the impurities, density and a diffusion coefficient, and a convective part, which might be some external electric field or something like this, or drifts, for example. And um, if you want to see what does it mean neoclassically if you make a prediction, then uh, you have here the gradient uh, part, yes, the diffusive part, and then you have here a second part which you can summarize as a convective part, where also a radioelectric field is inside, which is very important. And the question now is, uh, where does such a radioelectric field come from? Um, because if it is present, the radioelectric field determines the convection, but also the diffusion coefficient here for the diffusive part. Yeah? So it's very important. So it comes from the amipolarity of plasma ions leaving the plasma, of course. So usually in a tokamak, you have a toroidally um, homogeneous um, or symmetric plasma um, and you have uh, intrinsic ambipolar conditions there, fluxes there, uh, which is not the case for stellarators. In the case of stellarators, you have, of course, a three-dimensional plasma. You have a lot of uh, uh, traps and wells here where uh, charged particles, I think the uh, ions and electrons, uh, are bouncing and drifting out of the plasma, so we have very high losses uh, for particles with uh, low collisionality. And uh, so you cannot have ambipolar local ambipolarity at one position. And this leads to the uh, situation that you have quite high radioelectric fields uh, in the stellarator. Now, um, you see here, maybe you know this picture here, diffusion coefficient versus the collisionality. This here is, for example, the Tokamak, Verschluter region, Plateau region. And you see that these high losses here, uh, or that in the range of low collisionality, the stellarator has much higher losses uh, than the Tokamak. But by changing or by uh, tailoring the magnetic field, you can use this a radioelectric field which uh, you create by these high losses to, um, to stop the impurities, yes? So you can um, create um, E cross B uh, forces and we, so that the radioelectric field is acting as a de-accelerator, let's say, uh, for the plasma particles itself. That means you can really reduce in this region by the radioelectric field the losses and they will level out somewhere over here. There will be an equilibrium and maybe hopefully very close to the tokamak value and also if you reduce the ripple then you get rid of this disadvantage of the stellarator in, um, in this field. Now let's come to the impurities. This was now the background uh, um, plasma. And the impurities are swimming, let's say, on top of the background plasma. And um, of course, they, there is diffusion, but due to the radioelectric fields, the diffusion is dropped down very strongly. And now it's very interesting to see what is going on with the convective term. In the convective term, we have a radioelectric field and the direction of the electric field is very important. And what you see is if you have a plasma with low density and high heating power, then you have a high electron temperature and a low ion temperature. And the, uh, the losses of the plasma, the ion and electron losses, are arranged in then in this way that um, you have probably a positive radioelectric field. We call it electron root. And this means the impurities are flushed out of the plasma. This is what you expect. Yeah. This is a good situation, um, but we want to go to high densities. 
And at high densities, the predictions are in the way that you have nearly equal temperatures for electrons and ions. And the electric field which uh, set up might be uh, uh, negative. We call it iron root. And this means the impurities go direction to the plasma center and might accumulate there, which we don't like, of course. So, so far about the theoretical predictions. Question is now, what is the reality? What do we measure? Yeah. And the first question is, do we have unfavorable neoclassical inward-directed radioelectric field in reality? Yes, we have. <laughs> That's the problem. Uh, here in this discharge, you see this is a radioelectric field here. Uh, this is a plasma radius. And you see here, in, during this time, we had a radioelectric field which flushes impurities out. And during the high density case, we have a radioelectric field which uh, is inward directed. So we have such situations and we have to cope with it somehow. But the good thing is uh, that uh, if you compare the absolute values of fluxes in the, into the plasma of electrons and ions, of particles generally, then you find that you can not uh, explain this fluxes by neoclassical transport alone. You can only explain maybe one-fourth or half of the, uh, the transport by neoclassical processes. So we have additionally transport processes inside, um, some kind of anomalous transport, yeah, I write it here, maybe turbulent with a question mark. We don't know exactly. So we have a mixture of neoclassical and maybe turbulent transport, or anomalous transport, let's say, uh, to be carefully. And uh, this uh, uh, complicates the situation, of course. Um, so if you don't know exactly what do you have, you have to do everything. So you have to reduce, in any case, it's a demanding, uh, the impurity fluxes from the wall. Uh, and you have to really investigate and disentangle the neoclassical and anomalous contributions to the impurity transport, really to understand what's going on. And I show you some experimental results. Just at the beginning uh, of uh, the second comp uh, third campaign, our plasma was quite, uh, let's say, we had a quite high uh, oxygen content. You see it here, yes, very pronounced oxygen radiation and also carbon radiation. And uh, what you see here is if we want to increase for a certain heating power, if we want to increase uh, uh, the density, then we stop here at 2 times 10 to the 19 somewhere and then the radiation uh, increases very strongly and the plasma dies. And we think maybe, of course, it's impurity radiation, we have to reduce it, but nobody knows really, is it impurity radiation from the central part, uh, or is it more from the outer part? And uh, so we make a burnization, and after burnization, you see we could reduce the oxygen nearly by a factor of 10, and carbon also by something around a factor of 3. And immediately we were able to increase the density up to 10 to the 20, where we want to go in principle. So it was a successful uh, um, uh, process. And we want to understand what's going on un uh, at this critical density. Uh, is it core radiation which stops the plasma or is it edge radiation? And so we make one experiment where we puff in, you see here this is the ECRH power and this is a radiative power. And we puff in here neon up to the level nearly uh, of the heating power, and the plasma could cope this. It was no problem, I think. And the bolometer says that the radiation is somewhere here at the last closed flux surface. And this is what one would expect also from oxygen. So the radiation is mostly out, outside the confining region, and so um, the plasma should survive. Then we make a second puff here, and we increase the neon content, and this was then too much. 
and you see here the energy which was stable here now degrades. And what happens is that you cool the plasma at the edge and the radiation goes inward to, uh, uh, and find the temperature where it usually like to, to radiate. And this you can see here. It's moving inward inside the, uh, the confinement region. And then, of course, and then, of course, you have to subtract this radiation power from the heating power. And then the plasma dies. And during this phase here, you see it's clearly moving into the core, uh, core region. So, in principle, it's a wonderful radiative collapse, as you, <laughs> as you might know. It's well explainable. <laughs> Um, in order to, uh, to study the core impurity confinement, we um, uh, investigated by laser blow-off. It's an old-fashioned method, but nevertheless very useful. Uh, it's a glass plate which is covered by some metal which you want to investigate, and then you shoot with a laser and produce a, a beam of classes and neutral atoms penetrating the uh, plasma, and immediately you see in the spectrometers the iron line rising. Yeah. And then after some time, uh, this uh, signal decays, and the decay of the signal is some kind of uh, measure for the uh, confinement of this impurity, the resident time inside the plasma. And um, here you see it much better. Uh, I think the red line here is our signals. And the laser blow-off is deposit at the edge of the plasma with high gradients. And this high gradients here means that this uh, term here is the most important one and not this one. So from the movement here, we can derive the diffusion coefficient very nicely. And then it's moving inside the plasma towards higher temperatures. Here you see, for example, the sudden rise. These are different ionization states of iron. And then you see a sudden drop of the signals. And the sudden drop has nothing to do with confinement. These are just atomic uh, processes. It's the ionization into the next ionization states, and here into the next, and so on. Yes. And this is the last ionization state here. And after some time, the impurities uh, set up a kind of quasi-stationary distribution, which doesn't change in its shape, and then it's dropping. And this dropping here, this has something to do with the confinement, with the transport. And you see the rise time you can use for the determination of the diffusion coefficient, and this term here, the decay time, has to do with convection and diffusion. And uh, what we found is that, we, uh, that the neoclassical uh, diffusion coefficients, this here are 100 times neoclassical diffusion coefficients, so it's very, very low, and we found 100 times larger diffusion coefficients which we need to, uh, to fit our data than neoclassical one. And here you see a discharge, for example, with a power scan. And what you see is that with increasing power, uh, the, this um, residence time becomes shorter. And what you also see is that also the fluctuation level, density fluctuation level, increases here. Yeah. So we really need such high values because uh, you see here, if we try to fit this just neoclassically, it would be much, much too slow. We cannot fit our data with this. Oh. Ah. Okay. So um, we somehow transport seems to be correlated uh, with the um, fluctuation level. And Again, our hypothesis here in this case is might be this are um, um, uh, iron temperature gradient modes. This is just a hypothesis which we have. Uh, iron temperature gradient modes can be stabilized by the density gradient and they can be stabilized by the ratio of iron to electron temperature. And both we found here, yes. So, uh, if we, it, it's not inconsistent, let's say, 
Um, and if this is the case, we have a very high sensitivity of our impurity confinement on the, uh, uh, on the profiles of density and temperature. Um, so turbulence might affect particle and impurity transport. Uh, the pros are we have no accumulation. We are very happy about it, but the cons are maybe it's also responsible for the temperature uh, clipping of the iron temperature. So, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the, future, the future now is we want to improve our measurements uh, concerning the uh, impurity transport, the de derivation of the diffusion coefficient. And therefore, I told you, uh, with LBO, we uh, deposit it at the outside of, uh, at the edge, plasma edge. And here are the strong radians, and here we have a very sensitive measurement of the diffusion coefficient. Here, the, uh, the gradient flattens and it becomes unsensitive. So we would like to have a point-like impurity source in, inside the plasma, yeah, at this position. Then, Again, we have gra large gradients here, and we can again um, yeah, improve our measurements of, uh, of the diffusion coefficient. And here you see this test pool injector. Uh, this is, um, uh, we inject uh, with this test pool injector small polystyrene uh, pellets, which are filled with uh, amounts of impurities, and this is a cooperation between uh, NIFS and IPP and CMAT. It's, I think the leading uh, physicist is um, Tamura san And um, you see that if the pellet here enters the plasma, first the carbon shell is uh, um, evaporated, and then if the carbon shell doesn't exist in the core of the plasma, then immediately you get out the metal. So it's an ideal possibility to improve our measurement for later. So let's come to the summary. I think we successfully reduced the impurity influx by boronization, uh, and we come to higher density and also high performance. And what we found is that the diffusive uh, uh, impurity transport is somehow highly anomalous. The neoclassical transport is extremely low. The hypothesis uh, is maybe it's turbulent transport via iron temperature gradient modes. We have to look. And if this is true, we have a potential, of course, to control the turbulence level by profile shaping. We found no accumulative impurity behavior in ECRH discharges with higher heating power, heating power above one megawatt. But we found indications for long impurity confinement in um, low power ECRH discharges and pure NBI plasmas. And we could achieve stable high performance long pulse plasmas with reduced target loads so far. So. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. So, okay, Andre. Uh, thank you very much for a very interesting talk. A lot of uh, uh, very interesting information. Uh, if I may, a couple of questions with respect to the temperature clipping. So it looks very sophisticated. First, uh, making the pellet injection to pull in the TI and T electron and ion temperature closer together, uh, it looks like a temporal uh, solution. So you're starting this. Uh, I mean, can you do this on the long term or once started, these temperatures are going close together? And the second on the go, uh, it looks like it is also produced by the ECRH nature of heating. If you switch some time later to the NBI, which heats the ion temperature, would it be the solution of such a problem? Just your feeling about this. Um, I think um, up to now we only achieve it transiently. Yeah? So if you stop the pellet injection, uh, then uh, the plasma evolve in some way. 
Uh, in some cases, it does not decay completely to the last state, but it's, it reached some intermediate state. And um, yeah, concerning the electron temperature, uh, concerning the ECRH heating, um, I think uh, that in, in case of ECRH heating, we have we pump out uh, gas by um, yeah from the center of the absorption of the ECRH. Uh, in, in, in the case, if the temperature profile starts to peak a little bit, then we think this is a driving mechanism uh, to uh, flush out um, and to flatten the density profile. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Marek Sam. You very strongly addressed uh, impurities. Uh, so how often do you have to perform boronization to remove oxygen? That's a good question. I think um, uh, usually if you make a boronization, uh, the boronization on the highly loaded areas, like the diverter, for example, uh, the boron is a way, I would say, after a few shots. You, you get no, uh, no advantage of this concerning uh, the plasma facing components. But there is a, a resident um, beneficial effect for the, um, for the large uh, wall in the machine where you have maybe low fluxes to the wall uh, and you get low fluxes of impurities inside, but you have a very large area. So, uh, for example, oxygen, or let's say also iron, it's covered uh, um, for a long time. Yeah? And I think this is what, uh, 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 what is the beneficial effect here. Um, I think at the, um, at the limit, diverted plates, it's away immediately, but uh, the covering of the wall lasts, I think, I, I would say a month. Uh, Maybe longer. So just if I could comment, we really did not observe any significant degradation of, of end of the boronization. We were precautious. We did three during the whole campaign, but it was too many. We didn't need it. So what is your zeta effective? Uh, 1.5. Before boronization and after. Five before, 1.5 after. It's mainly, we think it's mainly the oxygen from the water of the wall, which yeah. we covered completely. But then it lasts a quite long time. We also observe on LHD uh, that accelerators they do not require so many polarization as Tokamax. Okay. So, uh, last one question. You, please. Just uh, two short question. One, uh, did you think about taking the larger hammer, so uh, applying ISRH, the ion heating? Mm. I think up to now, you know, we have no ion cyclotron uh, heating. I think we will have it in the last, uh, in the next campaign, uh, but maybe only with a low power. And I think they will uh, set up a program for it for the next campaign. Uh, the second one, uh, you are trying to study the diffusion with test balls, but as you have shown, the test balls change. The, the, the plasma enormously yes. because it, the, it improves this connection of the eye. So how uh, real the diffusion coefficient will be? Exactly. It's a good question. I think uh, in our case, these results which I showed you are done mostly with LBO. And I think with LBO, we can uh, adjust the amount so that we have nearly um, uh, no distortion. We can also use a high amount of LBO and then we have the same effect uh, also um, like the test ball. But also the test ball pellets, yes, well, you know we have, they have to prepare it in advance <laughs> and then you have to live with it and then we found maybe some test balls maybe have a, a too much uh, amount so we can also produce in a lower amount. But what I, what you are right, if you have a higher amount, you have the possibility to study an improvement of confinement because you change, uh, obviously, the density profile or the position, and then you immediately see that the fluctuation level goes down and the temperature rises. Okay, last question. 
Uh, Rainer, I, th I think that the initial results from Wendelstein 7X are, are fascinating and very promising for the future. But th this, this observation on the clipping of the iron temperature is, is certainly very concerning. Um, so I, I hope that you, you come to an understanding and, and can uh, sort it out in, uh, in stationary conditions. Wh one question I wanted to ask you in relation to that is, do you see uh, a corresponding reduction in global energy confinement when this clipping occurs? Yeah, that's, uh, of course, the, uh, <laughs> the question which has to be asked. Um, I think uh, in the case of... Uh, um, of these discharges where we exceed this limit, uh, we are uh, on the scaling, on right. the accelerator scaling. Right, that's wondering, yes. In the case where we don't exceed, uh, we are a little bit lower. Yeah, mm -hmm. Let's say not, not really, I think, Marcin, I think not a factor of, of two, I think it's something around 40% or so. This, this is, uh, let's say, our best discharges are something like a lousy H mode in Tokamax, and uh, and uh, the swells are something a bit below L mode. Yeah, so we are now in this range. Yeah.